Hi, this is Emma Caulfield, and you're listening to Dark Matter with Michael Parker. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Michael Parker. This is Dark Matter on Karma Air. It is Sunday, April the 13th, and for the remainder of the show, we are speaking with the paranormalist, paranormalist, uh, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. She is the author of over 30 books since the early 80s, and she was on the show in March, and we had such a wonderful conversation, and unfortunately, we were limited to an hour on that particular show that I really wanted to have her back. Um, the subject of that first show was actually the, kind of the larger field of the paranormal, which is the idea of the metaverse, uh, the inter- interdimensional aspect of the paranormal. And today, I wanted to... Um, pull it back just a little bit and talk more about the idea of ghost spirits, apparitions, poltergeist, hauntings, etc. Lucky for me, I was sent a copy of Rosemary's The Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits by her um, publisher, which is now in its third edition. And I highly recommend to all of you to pick up a copy of it. It's a beautiful book. It's an epic piece of work. There's an incredible amount of uh, of work in here. So without further ado, Rosemary, welcome back to the show. Michael, it sure is great to be back with you this evening. Thank you so much. We're so glad you could come back. I tell you what, when, when you were on the other night, um, my producer Jerry and I were fascinated by what you had to say. And when the end of the show came around, we're like, wow, we've got to talk some more. So I've been reading Ghosts and Spirits. I've been on your website reading all of your blogs and your articles. And one of the things that I wanted to talk to today, I mean, obviously the field of of ghosts and spirits and hauntings um, has become uh, has just mushroomed in, in, in popularity over the last several years, I think largely in part because of uh, many of the, the television shows that are out there. But I think there's some folks who are still new to these ideas, and there are some people who, when you talk about the paranormal in the realm of ghosts, spirits, hauntings, apparitions, I think they just think of, of the stereotypical idea of something that they might see in a cartoon or a, or a, or a thriller type of movie, which is, you know, the, the spirit of a person moving around. But there are so many different types of, uh, of, of activity. And, and in reading your work, I've, I'm getting a really quick education on this, that actually those types of, of ghosts and hauntings actually make up the minority of actual um, hauntings. It's quite a range, Michael, yes. Uh, I would say that um, if, if you investigate a haunted place or you happen to, for example, stay overnight in a haunted place, what you're most likely to, to encounter, if you encounter anything at all, is an imprint, mm-hmm. which is a, just kind of residual energy like a photograph in psychic space or a video loop in psychic space. And, and then we have uh, a whole range of, of more active hauntings, uh, presences that uh, exhibit intelligence, awareness of the living, the ability to interact, uh, those that have the ability to move objects about, poltergeist phenomena, uh, some apparitions which are sexually interested in the living and, and will assault people that way, uh, unhappy apparitions, uh, apparitions that uh, don't seem to, to care what people do, uh, non-human uh, presences haunting places. Uh, I think those, those account for a, a fair amount of activity in, in a lot of places, especially abandoned places. So um, sometimes you, you go out, when you do investigations, you never know what you're going to run up against. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the residual energies and the imprints first, because that's kind of where I wanted to start off um, our conversation today. I have a lot of questions to you today about a lot of different things. But um in our last conversation, we were talking about the metaverse and and this idea that you know if that everything is energy, everything interreacts, and um, I've had a couple of paranormal investigators on since you've been on, and we've had the the conversation has gone different ways. Different people believe different things, but one thing I wanted to ask you about imprints and this residual energy it actually makes a lot of sense to me because, and maybe you can explain to our listeners this this idea that. Um, emotional energy or the energy of actions or things that have happened from the past can remain in a place, but they're not necessarily, if I'm understanding correctly, um, they're not necessarily still attached to kind of a conscious entity. Is that a good way to explain it? Uh, yes, and, and that's very accurate. It's like uh, a piece or a shell of a living person or even an animal gets left behind uh, in quasi-physical space. Uh, 
Oftentimes, hauntings are associated with a lot of intense emotion, especially violent, angry, mm-hmm. unhappy emotion. There's something about the lower end of the scale that seems to make it easier to impress upon psychic space. It's like if you imagine that there was a curtain around you that uh, somebody could write something on or paint a picture on, and if you and you could only see it if you were in a certain state of consciousness, almost mm-hmm. like invisible ink, you know, mm-hmm. you... You're in the right uh, circumstances, and everything that's on that curtain suddenly becomes apparent. Uh, And that's probably a good way of describing an imprint haunting. It's around us all the time, but we have to be in the right frame of consciousness to perceive it. And uh, it's like going into a, a, a museum and seeing a painting on a wall. It doesn't change. It just stays there. Uh, sometimes it's animated like uh, a little movie clip, uh, and it just perhaps replays an event from someone's life or uh, a scene that, that took place on that particular location. I really believe that the energy of place, literally the stuff that's in the soil and even the structure of a building, have a great deal of influence on whether or not residual energies can hang in space and and also determine how long they last because of the molecular or elemental make of it makeup of of a particular place or or, or or thing well here here's what we've discovered through a paranormal investigation and also a bit through scientific research um, for one thing there's no good scientific explanation for any of this right. yet uh, we're you know, largely going on subjective experience and also what we observe by association. And uh, areas that have certain contents to the soil, like um, magnetite, iron, radon, uh, quartz, and mica, things that have magnetic and uh, high electromagnetic field properties to them, uh, clay-based soil with a high water content, same thing, these areas are often associated with uh, unusual paranormal activity, Mm -hmm. hauntings, mysterious creatures, UFO sightings, um, fairies, things like that. Uh, And so the speculation is that there may be something generated by these uh, fields of energy that uh, help this energy uh, remain in the physical plane or it acts some way on human consciousness that we can open up our own awareness to perceive it. I think it may be a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. There have been some scientific papers written on this, uh, not stating that one causes the other, but that the two are associated. I had, um, about a year or so ago, I had a a gentleman on here named Barry Taft, and he was... um, uh, doing some work um, here in Los Angeles, and he was talking about certain geomagnetic areas where um, there were people that thought that they were undergoing some type of parent, paranormal activity, but in fact, it, it, it seemed that the geomagnetic um, aberrations of the area were also having effects on people's minds, so you couldn't really tell, you know, if this was a authentic paranormal event or if there was you know, an effect that was happening to people's consciousness as a result of the proximity to these geomagnetic fields. It it certainly is a tangle, and uh, it's a very legitimate question that there's really no good answer for. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that um, it's probably a little bit of both. Sure. We get down to the question of what is an authentic paranormal experience anyway. They're all subjective. And it may take some sort of interaction uh, with a variety of factors or a confluence of factors even for us to have these experiences. I think the experiences are legitimate. Uh, We tune into something that's not a part of our ordinary reality. People have documented the same kinds of subjective experiences over the course of human history. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of weight in favor of um, accessing a bona fide um, other otherworldly uh, scenario uh, that exists in its own right. 
Well, one of the things that I was also very interested in in your writing was also this idea that that certain areas can act as portals. Um, and certainly we've talked about vortexes on the show in the past, like in, in, in Sedona or places like that. But this idea that, that some things are, are kind of portals. And one story that I read that you had given a lecture, and I'm trying to find my note here, um, and because I, I just have to ask you about this. Because when I read this, I was just flabbergasted. And it has to do with a, a lecture that you did a, a couple of years ago. And it was about this place called the Angela Webb House in New, in New Jersey. Yes. Um, I was hoping you could kind of tell our our listeners about that because, man, this this spooked me out, and it was a fascinating story. And if I'm understanding you correctly, then this is one of those places where we might have some type of hyperdimensional portal or something going on. Yes, uh, I'll be happy to, to give a, a little summary of it for the okay. listeners out there. It Appreciate certainly it. ranks as one of the most unusual hauntings I have ever encountered, and also the, the psychic uh, that I worked with, Carl Petri, mm-hmm. uh, he feels the same way, and he's uh, investigated many, many haunted places. The whole area around what's called the Angela Webb House is one of these areas with a lot of unusual activity, um, legends of cursed lands, UFO sightings, fairies, uh, violence, uh, high number of suicides, uh, accidents, um, ghosts and apparitions, people with poltergeist phenomena. Mm-hmm. The home is a private residence, and so I can't uh, say where exactly sure. in New Jersey it is, but I call it the soul-eating house because... That's not a good thing, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> not a good thing, uh, and I've never encountered a place like it, um, but... It seems that if you own this house and you die while you own it, regardless of how and where you die, the house kind of eats you as a ghost. You become a ghost in the house. And there are many, many ghosts in this house. It was built back in the 1700s in colonial time, made out of field stone with a lot of quartz in it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the case came to light in the late 1990s uh, was brought to the attention of Carl Petri, who lives in northern New Jersey, in Kearney, New Jersey, and uh, he did some investigation. It was owned by uh, a single woman who acknowledged that uh, she had a lot of ghosts living with her. Sometimes she could tolerate them, sometimes she couldn't. They created a lot of disturbances in the house. Mm-hmm. There were full-bodied apparitions, violent poltergeist activities, And what's more, she had sexual encounters with the ghosts in the house, and she admitted to having had sex with the ghosts many times. Mm -hmm. Um, If people came to stay overnight, they were assaulted by the ghosts sexually, or they were disturbed by the apparitional activity. There were people who didn't want to stay there, said they would never come back. Even members of her own family didn't like to go to the house because of the unusual atmosphere. Understood. Well, unfortunately, the owner of the house died in 9-11, and um, she is now a ghost in the house. It has uh, passed through several ownerships since then. Uh, It has been occupied for a while now by uh, a particular family. Whether or not they're having disturbances, nobody knows because they're not interested in talking to any investigators. Really? But um, the phenomena... That um, that Carl experienced there was quite pronounced. Uh, we even think that we captured um, an apparition on uh, video cam. Uh, we were taking some shots uh, of the interior of the house, and um, Carl felt uh, a presence go by in front of the camera. And when you look at the frames um, of that particular moment, there's like a a wavy ripple in the picture, almost like suddenly someone ripples water. Mm-hmm. And uh, is it the ghost? Uh, it's certainly an anomaly on the film, and it happened at about the time that he felt the presence passing. But one of the things that I found very interesting about this case was the tolerance of the owner, that she had kind of a love-hate relationship with the ghost. Most people encountering a place like that wouldn't be able to move out soon enough. Right. Uh, And yet she alternately tolerated it, didn't like it, wanted to control the ghost, 
make them do what she wanted them to do. Uh, and then she just let them do what they wanted to do, mm-hmm. you know. And, they, and it seemed that the ghost kept asserting that it really wasn't her house, it was their house. This woman that, that owned it and died in 9-11, was she, um, was she mentally uh, competent or was she also, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how, I mean, this sounds like a very difficult place to live in. So, I mean, and you bring up an excellent point. Why did she live there? I mean, was she off a little bit or was she a perfectly sane person who was just okay with this? I mean, does anybody know what her personal state was? We don't. Uh, And a lot of it was, uh, unfortunately, there really wasn't much time for investigation Mm -hmm. prior to Mm 9-11. In fact, um, there was a television crew from England that got interested in the case and was going to come over. Um, You know, we were going to set up a lot of surveillance equipment, uh, get some interviews on camera with her, and none of it came to pass because of 9-11. So um, it's it's a legitimate question to raise, you know, what makes people have tolerance of this? I mean, I have met other people who are quite comfortable living in uh, homes that have a lot of haunting activity, not as extreme as this, but uh, and they're not bothered by it, whereas most people would be bothered by even a small amount of activity because it disturbs what we feel is normal, ordinary reality, something we can't predict, control, see, you know, that sort of thing. There was a previous owner that um, the the woman tracked down. She got interested in the history of the house mm-hmm. and the fact that a lot of unusual things had happened there. So she, uh, she was able to track a previous owner uh, who was under treatment for mental um, problems. Mm-hmm. And she visited the woman in the clinic, and the woman told her, get out. Get out mm-hmm. while you can, because if you stay there, it's going to be bad for you. Yeah. Uh, and now, was this other one? One thing we don't know also is, did this other woman have problems to begin with, or did right. the house kind of um, trigger something within her? Because certainly this kind of activity uh, could easily emotionally and mentally stress somebody to a breaking point. I would think so. Well, you mentioned something um, at the beginning of, of your description of this house, and I don't remember what all you said that, that, that it was made out of, but you did mention that there was quartz in, in the building materials of the house? It was made out of field stone, field stone and wood. Uh, you know, your typical colonial home, quite okay. large, uh, and had it had a barn or has a barn and, and a large garden area. It may have even been part of a... Uh, originally a larger farm estate. In fact, I think the original owner was a farmer. Um, a lot of the old colonial buildings that um, are, are even more recent homes that are made out of field stone, if there's a lot of mica and quartz in the field stone, we find them associated again yeah. with um, unusual activity. And, and I think it's because of the, uh, the electromagnetic mm-hmm. properties uh, in the quartz itself may act as a, an attractor, a battery, something that keeps a certain frequency of energy active. Well, it's interesting because when you mentioned that, the first thing I thought of was just a couple of weeks ago, we had a, a gentleman on here and we were talking about crystal skulls and, and the idea that uh, most of them are made of quartz and they are able to store energies and, and, you know, almost like you said, like a battery and, uh, so this this makes sense to me. It does. It certainly has made sense to me over the years that I have been doing paranormal investigation and the uh, the kinds of environmental conditions that I see associated with areas of intense, unusual, and, and high activity. Um, now, Carl feels, and I do agree with him, that structure also can make a difference that there's something about the way certain buildings or styles of buildings are constructed Hmm. that can augment that. For example, he feels that Victorian home architecture is very conducive to retaining um, imprints and active haunting activity. I think it's kind of interesting that we associate the old Victorian house with a lot of ghost activity in our popular literature and film. This is Lon Friend, author of Life on Planet Rock. 
and you're listening to Dark Matter with the one and only conscious rebel, Michael Park on Karma Air. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Michael Parker. This is Dark Matter on Karma Air. It is Sunday, April the 13th. Today, we're speaking with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. And Rosemary, I've got to tell you something that we were just talking about here in the studio. It has been a really weird day for us because um, several strange things have happened in the studio today regarding our internet. This morning, and you know, I don't know if this has anything to do with us having this conversation today, but something very disturbing happened to me this morning. And I was going to ask you about it later in the show, but we were uh, Jerry and Alicia and I who are on the studio right now. And so I want to relay a couple of things and it could just be, you know, uh, random things. But first of all, before, uh, well, an hour or two ago, before the show, um, before my show came on, um, Libby, who is the show before mine, all of a sudden the karma air site goes down. I noticed this from home because I'm kind of concerned. I'm like, well, wait a minute, you know, what's up? Why is the karma air site? going down um so i call up here and they say you know we're, we're trying to fix it and but also something really weird happened to me this morning i wake up and i go to my email and i have two emails from this person who i'm not going to name on the air because i don't know if this is a real person or not and in these two emails they're very nasty and they're directed at me um about i'm a musician um have been a musician on and off throughout my life but in these two emails from this person who i have no idea who is they talk about me being very mean to this other person who i also don't know who is and so my first thought is okay they think that i'm somebody else right and they they're very nasty in this email about how i'm a very mean bully person i think most people who know me know that i'm pretty much the farthest thing from a bully and uh, pretty much i mean every band i've ever been in i remember every single individual who i was in a band with and can tell you a lot about them so i don't know if this person thinks that i'm someone else named michael parker who's also a musician or what and then but then i realized well okay so if they think i'm someone else how do they have my email address and then today um alicia's telling me that we've been getting weird emails here at work um about various people on various shows i, I don't know it's just it rosemary it's been a very strange day and um you know i'm kind of laughing it off but i'm a little bit creeped out as well it sounds like an interesting confluence of things, yeah. and uh, I noticed that there are pockets of these sorts of things that affect uh, a lot of people who are involved in the paranormal, and mm. um, I I don't know what the reason is for some of them. Um, it seems that um, sometimes when a lot of intense energy is focused in a certain direction, it sort of makes the trickster factor. Uh, a lot of the show hosts who have uh, paranormal-oriented shows that uh, I'm, I'm on and I know uh, tell me that they frequently have uh, problems with uh, things staying up, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on air or, you know, going haywire on the air. Uh, it's just interesting. There is a strong trickster element in the paranormal, and it can get very bizarre at times. Mm -hmm. I, I've often wondered if certain things like... Um, uh, phases of the moon or solar flare activity yes. or uh, low pressures in the atmosphere, uh, how much of our environmental geophysical factors can influence this sort of thing, too. And we have had a swath of really bizarre weather across the country in the mm -hmm. last week or so. You're right. Well, it's it's very, I mean, this morning when I first, I walked in there, I, I got to be honest, when I first saw these things, I got a chill. And then I said, oh, well, you know, it, somebody thinks that I'm someone else. But if they think I'm someone else, how do they have my email address? I, I, I don't know. It was very weird. And then I, and then, I don't know. And, and I'm not saying that any of this necessarily has a paranormal aspect to it, but it was very strange, which, but actually brings me to something else I was going to ask you about. Obviously, you've talked, um, about EVPs before, Frank's boxes, things of that nature. And it was just funny that this stuff happened today because one thing I was going to ask you about is aspects of the paranormal, various levels of entities or, or spirits, ghosts, hauntings, etc. If they can do things in a, in a poltergeist manner or a teleportational manner or psychokinetic kind of manner, 
it would make sense to me that eventually we should be seeing things happening within computers and within modern communication type devices. And then when I was looking in your book, I saw this thing about um, people who uh, get phone calls from the dead. And so, I mean, I guess I'm just kind of putting it out there for you to comment on, but I, I have you ever heard of people getting um, emails or messages via computers that were related to paranormal activity? Yes, I have. And it's something that I think bears watching and may certainly increase, you know, literally the ghost in the machine sort of yes. thing. If a ghost can affect our environment, cer- certainly ghostly activity can uh, impact our uh, technology, too. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a, in, in the field of instrumental transcommunication, which is oriented toward real-time two-way communication with the dead and other realms via telephone, fax, computer, camera, uh, you know, all kinds of high-tech ways. Uh, People have reported getting um, spontaneous emails that that they say are from people on the other side, uh, fax transmissions, um, the computer gets affected itself. One of the books that uh, a few years ago, when I started one of my encyclopedias, I, I had some psychokinetic things going on uh, where my computer would turn itself on all by itself. Wow. Uh, and nothing ever happened. My files didn't get messed up, but I'd never had that before. And it, it just happened in a period of time when I was starting work on, on this one particular new book. And why that kicked up. I still have no explanation for. But well, what was the I topic that, of that particular one? I'm sorry to interrupt, but which the that particular book? What was the topic that at that time? The Encyclopedia of Saints. Hmm, interesting. I I think this is the same. This is a book that I had wanted to do for quite some time, and uh, I think that the saints. Um, it's a, the communion of saints is a very real presence to me, and uh, they're heavy duty. They. They've got a, a heavy message for, for people, and it's about, you know, spiritual purification and uh, right living and, uh, you know, spiritual discipline. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that I got some sort of communication uh, from, from this presence when I started the book, and it certainly was one of the more... Uh, I trying to find the right word, arduous maybe, uh, might be the right word. Uh, I spent two years working on that and another book about the saints, uh, totally immersed in their lives, their writings, uh, their spirituality, uh, their victories and their their defeats. And uh, I felt very profoundly changed at the end of that period, uh, just from having been in that field of energy. If if the computer was turning itself on, do you think that we could interpret that as them wanting you to get to work and do the book? I'm interpreting it that way, Michael, because nothing bad happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have any of my files messed up. Nothing ever got lost or, uh, you know, twisted in any way, damaged in any way. Um, if I had to put a spin on it, I would say it's like, well, hurry up and get started, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's time to get to work on it. And it only happened for a short period of time when I was getting going on the project. But I've never had that with any other book. And, and as you and a lot of the listeners out there know, I have dealt with some very strange and dark and bizarre topics. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've written 30, 32 books, 31, 32 books, which is a, a huge amount of work. And I and I take my hat off to you. I've got to say, um, I got Ghost of Spirits in the mail um, earlier this week. And for those of you guys who've not um, seen one of Rosemary's books, this is this is fantastic because um, because it's written in the form of encyclopedia. I mean, you could literally start reading it anywhere. It's it's not like you know, oh, I'm a loser because I started the book, I didn't finish it. It's one of those things where you can just turn through pages and start reading it. And um, Rosemary, I mean, what 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 inspired you to say, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to make this my life's work and I am going to, uh, make these, these, these large volumes of books and, and exert the amount of work that is taken to do these things. What, what inspired you to do that? I, I think how I came in into writing all of these books is a good demonstration of, 
um, following the signs and your gut instincts and uh, allowing for the right path to unfold in front of you. I originally did not intend to write these books. Um, I have wanted to be a writer for most of my life. Mm-hmm. I, as soon as I could pick up a crayon, I was I was writing things. Mm-hmm. But my original ambition was to be a novelist. Okay. I wanted to write mystery, suspense, horror, action, adventure, and I have done some novels. I've done them under pseudonyms. Um, but the paranormal has always been a personal pursuit of mine because of psychic experiences in my family when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And the two came together. Um, it was back in the 80s when uh, suddenly there was a big upsurge of interest in metaphysical topics. I had uh, some editors who knew that I knew a lot about the paranormal, and I was asked to write some nonfiction books, including an encyclopedia. And I had never entertained an idea of writing an encyclopedia. Uh, and I discovered in the course of doing it, my very first one was the Encyclopedia of Witches and Witchcraft, which is now going into its third edition this year, uh, that uh, I had a knack for this style of writing, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, so now I've, uh, I've done eight encyclopedias out of the 32 books uh, that I've done. And uh, it's, it's like I found my calling. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have not written fiction in quite some time. I've written a lot of self-help nonfiction books. But it was a, a merging of my personal and professional interests that enabled me to really pursue my life's passion. And that's what I feel I'm doing. Really what I was meant to do in this lifetime is uh, is write these books as part of my personal exploration, but also as a way of putting information together for people uh, that really helps them with their own experiences. That's what my whole orientation is. How do we explain our experiences? How do we have them? Why do we have them? What do we do with them? And how do our experiences with the paranormal help us in our personal life and our spiritual growth? Well said. We're speaking with Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Um, We're going to come back for a full hour with Rosemary uh, here on the other side. We're going to take a quick break, pay some bills. When we come back, I want to ask Rosemary about the idea of getting hauntings, spirits, ghosts to leave a residence or a location where the inhabitants of the particular place, they just really don't want these these things around anymore. How can we make that happen? What does it take? 